In sports, tributes continue to pour in for the late boxing legend Muhammad Ali, whose memorial service will be held in his hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. Dr. Kofi Amwa, an astute businessman and chairman of the local organizing committee of the 2008 African Cup of Nations, knew Muhammad Ali personally, and he has been sharing his memories with Joy Sports editor, Nathaniel Lato. Welcome to this very special edition here on the Joy News Channel on Multi TV. My name is Nathaniel Atto, and we're still celebrating uh, Muhammad Ali, a man who uh, transcended sport and uh, was a global icon uh, during his lifetime. We have been speaking to uh, greats who obviously have had contact with him, and one of them is astute businessman Dr. Kofi Amoa, also known as Citizen Kofi, who uh, knew him at close range uh, from the United States of America where he spent um, a, a very relatively long part of his uh, life, uh, private and business. And so this, uh, uh, within these moments, would want to celebrate Muhammad Ali and uh, look at him through the lenses of Dr. Kofi Amwa. Thank you very much, Citizen Kofi, for your time. Thank you, junior citizen. Uh, thanks for coming to talk to me about a great man um, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, um, he's the second person, second American who passed away and I shed tears. Wow. The first one was John Kennedy when we were in uh, primary school at Opokuari. Um, Ali, as you know, has had a tremendous influence, not just through sports, boxing, but through his humanity and his belief for justice and civil rights impacted a lot of people. So I'm, I must say that I was quite fortunate uh, to have a chance to know him. Um, first time my life brushed with his was when he came to Ghana in 1964. Okay. I was a young pupil in a village school, uh, Tikrum, near Kumasi. Okay. So when Ali uh, came to Ghana and he was coming to Kumasi, our head, uh, headmaster guided us to go to the Kumasi airport to meet, to meet him. And I don't know if it's providential. Luckily for me, uh, the next graphic that came out on the front page was this picture of Muhammad Ali with some school kids. And here's my little grinning face in the background. So that's the first encounter, obviously, then I did it. You must have kept that. because it's. Uh, I used to have it, but I don't know where I put it. I have to go back to the graphic archives. Maybe I can sure. get it, retrieve sure. it. Sure. Um, and then when I went to the United States to go to school, um, uh, after a while, I was in Los Angeles. I moved down to Los Angeles, and he had then come to live in Los Angeles. Um, so I had some friends who knew him quite well, and he was a part, he was having a party in his house, and um, I had a chance to go to his home, and that's when I talked to him about meeting him in Ghana when he came, and then we exchanged numbers, and I got a chance to talk to him uh, frequently. And also and get a chance to. Hold the, that yeah. one a bit. I, I'm, I'm imagining you, uh, you know, from that whole period where, even though you stood next to him to take a picture, which was published in the national newspaper, now had him next to you, and you, you had grown, you had become a successful man, and you here you were with him within the same space. I mean, what was the immediate impression, uh, first of all, when you met finally, like, one-on-one -on -one to, to, to have a conversation? Well, when I got a chance to go to his home, I said, I'm going to tell him this story, wow. <laughs> you know. And he remembered coming to Kumasi. Uh, in 1964, when he came to Ghana, Muhammad Ali was huge, you know. So the, the expectation uh, was huge. And uh, so that's why we traveled from the village to go and meet him at the airport and then had a chance to take that picture. Now, when I told him the story, he said, and I said, I also reminded him, you say you marry a Ghanaian woman. Do you remember that? <laughs> which, he, which he laughed, yeah. uh, laughed his heart out. Yeah. So that created the bond of, of him. Um, you know, he had just won the, 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 the title. And his belief in black people made him want to come and visit Africa. And he chose to come to Ghana, uh, Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana, because at that time, Ghana was a symbol of the resurgence of Africa. So most of these uh, people who were interested in civil rights 
if they wanted to do anything in Africa, Ghana was the place that they would come. So he came here. So it was obvious that Ghana had an indelible memory uh, with him. And, and his coming here was something that he didn't forget at all. He made up details, the food he ate, you know, dancing the high life, wearing the kente. So he was, he was really um, um, expansive in his memory for Ghana. So I think that's what got me to get close to him by him giving me his phone number. But what I want to say is that for me, his lesson to all of us is the deep belief he had in justice and civil rights. And that, that belief made him take a lot of decisions that were sacrificed for his profession, for his money making, uh, for his life, um, being drafted to the US Army to go and fight in Vietnam. Uh, the story has been told, so everybody knows he rejected that. They had no problem with the Vietnamese, and that there were bigger problems in the United, United States to solve, and that he's not going to go. And because of that, his license, is, 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 he lost his title. He was suspended. And for three years, at the height of his uh, sports uh, career, he couldn't fight. And he lost millions of dollars. So it tells a lot of story of the sacrifices that we, too, we as human beings, can take from the lessons of somebody like Muhammad Ali in following our beliefs and doing what we can to resurrect and make changes. If it's about justice, it's about civil rights, it's about economic independence. For us in Ghana and Africa, I think this is where we are in terms of elevating the lives of our people and that at least life is a shining example of what can be accomplished. Wow, great. You know, um, you, you, you had personal you know, uh, communication with him. Um, can you just recollect you know, the, the days when you used to communicate with him once in a while, and specifically also the very last time you, you had a conversation with him over phone or over text or whichever it was? Um, when he moved out of Los Angeles, uh, he changed his number, our communication kind of uh, died. But at the time that he was in LA, I used to see him quite a lot. And Ali liked to go to the nightclubs, you know, um, and, and I like to go to the nightclubs too. So we used to do that a lot. And he also did a lot of appearances at sports events, which sometimes you invite me and I'll go. Um, but he was a very jovial, very comedic, a kind of person, you know, um, play uh, tricks with cards yeah. and make things disappear. <laughs> but for me, he talked a lot about black people, about Africa, about our position in world history, and about slavery, colonialism, and the reason why he even came to Ghana was that Ghana was the first country uh, to get political independence. Mm -hmm. Um, and Nkrumah was very happy to see him. I think a lot of people have seen the pictures that he took in Ghana with him. Um, so my, my relation with him was more the black world and what, what we must do and can do uh, to, get, to gain respect and also to elevate the lives of our people. Well, you used to revel a lot, as you've said, and uh, you know, I'm wondering, I mean, so anytime you guys went out, what was it aside the music and, and the good company? I mean, what else were you getting up to? I mean, when you, all the time when you went out? Well, mind you, this man is huge. When we went out, it's not just me and him. There are a lot of people around. And also the people, wherever we went, everybody wants to get an autograph. And he was very, very uh, liberal with, with, with signing autographs. But um, he, he liked African food. Um, so we talked about that. I tried to get him to my house to eat, but he couldn't come that day. So I prepared a meal and I had it sent to his house, which, wow. he, which he liked. See. I made some jollof rice. I'm a good cook, by the way. One day I'll come on your show. And Great. <laughs> so, so you made it yourself and had it sent yeah, to him? Yeah, good wow. jollof rice, yes. Wow. You that know. must have been some very good reminiscing for him, especially considering that he was here. Oh, yeah, we were, we were close. We were close. Ali, Ali was nah, not the only African. He had quite a few African friends. So sometimes you invite a bunch of us from, especially from Zaire, from Congo, uh, where, he, you know, he fought. Yeah. Um, and we'll go to his house and play the highlight music and other mm -hmm. African songs and, wow. and just have a party like that. I see. Um, it, it's sad that he's gone, but um, I think we should all uh, take comfort 
in the good works that he left behind. For all of us. Well, um, let's touch now on the final moments. I don't know if you remember your last interaction or the last moment you spent with him back there in the US or your last communication via phone. Would you remember and remember the, the subject and the circumstances? Yes, this was about a month uh, before he was diagnosed with um, Parkinson's disease. Um, it was a month. If, those of us who talked to him often could tell changes gradually coming in his voice and him, his energy level going down. Um, after that, I didn't have any communication with him again. Um, he had moved from Los Angeles. I think his number changed. And, um, but I said prayers for him. Um, I'm saying prayers for him still now. Um, he had a tremendous impact on all of us who came uh, across to him. So that's the last time that I had communication with him. You know, um, He always thought about wanting to come back to, to Ghana. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, and, and he got this Parkinson's disease that really debilitated him and slowed him down tremendously. Uh, but even with that, we all saw that uh, he was not ashamed to come out. He went and lit the, the flame at the Olympic Games in, in, in Atlanta. Uh, he was seen in many public places, uh, showing that, yes, a great man uh, who was proud of himself, did great things, can also be brought down. The Lord can humble you. And, and, and with that, uh, he became a spokesperson for uh, people who afflicted with Parkinson's, uh, raised a lot of money for research in the Parkinson's disease. Uh, we know the center in his name, um, in his hometown, uh, has been built. So Ali continued to uh, inspire people, um, especially young people, children, uh, throughout his life until the day he died. The other day, on CNN, one of his daughters was talking about uh, the conviviality of all his children surrounding him in that hospital bed, and him telling uh, his senior brother, uh, don't, don't, don't weep for me. I'm at peace with myself. I'm going to see my Lord. Uh, you guys, you've done enough. Don't cry for me. I'm OK. So it's, it's, it's good for us, those of us who knew him, to know that uh, he left this, this earth uh, feeling comf comfortable and being at peace with himself and with his maker. And I hope all of us will take a lesson from that and adjust our lives and bring it into equilibrium to make sense as to our time passing through this world, uh, our relationship with our children, uh, with our co-workers, with our employees, with our friends. Uh, I think those become the most important things uh, compared to the material things that all of us sometimes get blinded to follow. Doc, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, too. I appreciate it. And that's it for sports. And in less than 24 hours, the world will bid Muhammad Ali a final farewell in Louisville, Kentucky. You're still live on The Pulse.